Well, welcome to uh, our next lecture. This is our second lecture in part two. And last time we did an introduction to part two of the Mor Nebuchim. And in the introduction, the Rambam laid out uh, the 25 slash maybe 26 <coughs> <coughs> principles of Aristotelian physics. Now, <clears throat> I want to emphasize now that, and I, I mentioned this last time, that so far, what Ramam is doing here is laying out really the uh, summarizing the basic scientific principles of the day. It's as if you sat down to a, a physics class in college. He didn't teach any, any Torah, any spiritual knowledge. He's teaching what he understood to be science, right? In today's, in chapter one, and chapter one is quite long, and I'm not going to read through all of the words because it's we would really get lost in philosophical um, axioms and proofs and so on. And it, I think we'd really get lost in it. I am going to summarize what he proves as we go through chapter one uh, and, and, you know, the basic ideas. But the, what's important for us to recognize is what Ramam is doing in chapter one is using what he understood to be the most modern science of his day and using it to prove the basic principles uh, of, 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 of religion, which are the idea that there is one God, right? Uh, that he's one, he's uni the unity of God as a number one. And number two, the idea that, um, that the world is created and, 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 um, and you, know, uh, you know, that it had a starting point and, and, and that he's not corporeal, that he doesn't have a body. So, so it's really important. I, I want to emphasize this because we're going to be, in, in a lot of senses, some people start wondering, like, well, how is this relevant today to learn this A Aristotelian proofs for the existence of God? If all of these Aristotelian proofs, we've long since thrown them scientifically, at least in the wastebasket, and we've moved on from them a significant amount in modern science. Well, that, that's it's a very good question. However, I would like to posit that that is the the way Rambam takes the science of his day and applies it and 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 reconciles it with the Torah, which is the purpose of this book, is extremely instructive today when we take modern science and try to reconcile it with the Torah. And th that's why it's important. So even though some of these ideas have long since moved, we've moved on from them scientifically and philosophically, but seeing how the Rambam applies these ideas and reconciles it with the Torah. Is, is really beautiful, spectacular, and extremely relevant. So don't, so we're, we'll get a little bit lost in these Aristotelian things, but as we move on through this second book, right, we'll start to see how the Rambam understood the, this conflict or this potential conflict and how to resolve the potential conflict between Torah and science. In a sense, the Rambam had it a little easier than us because he can use the science of his day to prove the existence of God, which is what Aristotle himself did as well with, the, with some significant differences, which we're going to emphasize. So let's, in chapter one, um, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read through all of the words. I'm at, I'm right now on page 243 in the Pines. I'm just going to tell you basically what he proves in each paragraph. I might read a few snippets here and there, but you're obviously, you know, everyone is welcome to read it. But if you do, uh, I, I, I wish you the best. And, I, and you'll understand why I didn't want to read it word for word. But, um, but so, so the, the first, the, in the first chapter, right, uh, in the first paragraph, Ramam says, uh, the one that starts, it follows necessarily from the 25th premise that there is a mover, right? The 25th premise was, uh, you know, the Rambam mentioned before, and that is, is that, um, you know, basically that that there has to be something that that moves. If something moves, something has to be moving it, right? So, so the the uh, the basic idea that Ramam proves in the first paragraph is the idea. And I do want to turn your attention to one thing here. If you look down in the middle, um, it is as if you say it's like the, it's the last words on the line, maybe about fifteen lines down in that paragraph. Uh, just to understand what he's saying. This stone, which was in motion, was moved by a staff. In other words, a person takes a stick and knocks a stone onto a, to plug up a hole in the ground or something. So the stone was in motion. It was moved by a stick. The stick was moved by a hand. The hand was moved by tendons. The tendons by muscles. The muscles by nerves, right? Um, <clears throat> this is really, really cool because you see Ramam had a, a 
very sophisticated for his time understanding of anatomy because this is pretty much correct even today, right? You know, the, uh, he wouldn't have understood that the nerves transmit a message to the muscles, but they were able to tell that the nerves deliver, you know, cause the muscles to move. The nerves by natural heat. So this is where he's using uh, the, the medicine of his day, the ga Galenic medicine from Galen, that there's this natural heat that the body has that gives it energy. The natural heat by the form that subsists therein. This for the form meaning remember what we said before the sur homer and sura the form the 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 form is the soul is the person's soul right uh, scientifically we would call that a person's brain or consciousness this form being undoubtedly the first mover so it has to go back to the first mover now obviously you and I and what makes the mover move right it could be an opinion meaning I think to myself well hey that stone should it would be better off if that stone was over there. Or, hey, that stone is in my way. It's gonna, people are going to trip over it. I'm going to move it away, right? So um, so if you keep going back, you eventually go, you can say, so, well, what causes that to move and what that to move and so on and so forth. The point being that eventually you get back to a prime mover, right? And I'm going to turn the page to page 244. And there has to be, and Ram goes through some sophisticated Aristotelian proofs to prove that there has to be ultimately a prime mover moving the a prime mover that moves everything right the next issue if um uh then the, at the end of at the end of that long paragraph which is the top of page 244 which is a paragraph that started on 243 the Ramam says now the mover now if Ramam had already explained to us that everything in the, the the outer sphere that keeps that rotates around is what makes the inner spheres move and the inner sphere makes the sphere inner inner to that and so on and so forth down to earth and then all of that movement causes all of the the four elements that make up the earth right e earth air water and fire uh, it causes it pushes them and causes them to to interact in such ways that creates all of the energy that makes everything on the world move that's a very short version of aristotelian physics right so what makes that outer sphere move right it has to be one of the following four things i'm just looking at the last sentence of that chat paragraph either another body outside it, either there's something out there, somebody outside all of all this thing that's playing a game and spinning around the outer wheel, right? So it's something outside of it, right? Or um, separate from it, <clears throat> right? Meaning something completely different, right? Some, in other words, outside of it, meaning there's another sphere, right? That's the first idea. The second idea is, is that, um, is that, uh, is that it, it's, it's, it's something completely different from that one which we're going to get to in a minute, because that's the one that he's going to conclude, right? Or a force distributed in it, or it has to be like a soul of a person that makes a person move. So within that sphere, there's something that's making it move, or an indivisible force, or there's some kind of a force, right, that makes it move. And, and I'm going to, um, so given those four possibilities, the Ramam basically concludes, right, several things. The idea that it's another sphere, he says in the second paragraph, can't, doesn't make sense. It can't be another sphere because then there's another sphere and then another sphere. Like, where does it end? It doesn't make sense. So he proves that, right? The third possibility that it's within it, the Rambam proves, and this is the second paragraph there. It also doesn't make sense because the sphere is something finite. And if the thing moving it is finite, then it has to be divisible and so on. You can look at the Aristotelian proofs back and forth. But Rambam knocks that one out. The fourth possibility is that it subsists in the sphere, but it's an indivisible sphere. The Rambam also disproves that also based on the Aristotelian premises. So he's left with, um, with uh, if we at the bottom of 244, I sh uh, it, it is that, um, is that uh, he brings an interesting example. I should add here the explanation that follows. When, for example, the soul of a man, which is his form, moves him to go up from a house to an upper chamber, right? Well, actually, you know what? It's going to get into something really wild. So, so um, I'm going to, uh, he, so he, he goes through that in order to conclude, right, that it cannot possibly be any of the, the either number one, three, or four, and it has to be a completely different thing, entity, that's making the outer sphere move, right? After setting up all these proofs on 245, I'm going to jump to 246 now, right? And at two, that in the top, in the paragraph that leads off 246, he comes off with, after using all these Aristotelian proofs based on the ideas that we said, he comes off with 
several conclusions. Number one, everything has to go back to a prime mover. There has to be something that's making it all go, right? Number two, that thing can't be another body because that would be the infinity issue that another body, another body, another body. And the other one, it can't be um, within it because then it would be finite. It has to be something that's completely outside of it. In other words, something completely separate from physical existence, okay? So therefore, it has to be that that's the only way to understand it. And of course, that is the deity that would be God, right? Um, so and the, the, the importance of this, the important idea of this is what Ramam just did was he scientifically, according to his scientific principles, proved the existence of a deity. Now, we can argue that today, now that we don't agree with this in principles, that these proofs won't work. And indeed, it's prob we're probably right when we say that. But it's still important for us to learn this for the reasons which I stated in the beginning. So let's keep on understanding the way Rambam thinks this through. Okay. Um, the, uh, at, um, if we continue on the, on this page, he, he, he continues in the last second in the next paragraph, which starts a second speculation made by them er, er, is, is the idea that the, um, that the deity cannot have motion, right? It cannot be something that moves. Because if it moves, it has to have a mover and so on. And, uh, and it has to be something that can't be divisible. It can't be two. Okay. Um, and he also uses Aristotelian proofs to prove that. If we look on page 247, when he talks about a third philosophic speculation, right? He says that that deity can't be something that's uh, subject to generation and corruption, right? It can't be something that comes to be and then has an end. Like, like human beings, we were born and we die, right? But God can't be something that has generation and corruption and has, God has to be someone or some entity that exists completely on its own and never, and never was created and never gets destroyed, okay? So, um, and that would be uh, the, 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 the second paragraph on page 247 where he proves that. I'm, I'm turning to page 248. And I said, you're welcome to read through all his proofs, but they, you can literally, you can, your mind will just go, if you can do it, all honor to you. But I just want to give out the basic ideas. On page 248, in the long paragraph there, is is that that um, is is he demonstrates the idea that God or the deity cannot have a cause. There's nothing that made God come about. God has to be its own his own cause. His with a capital H. Okay, so that's what he deals with on 248, and he proves that. On 249, um, he dis is, is to, he discusses in the paragraph there on 249 of the fourth speculation. He also uses Aristotelian uh, proofs to show that that the um, as just like uh, on Earth, right? We see things that are have potential, right? And then we see them come into action. Like right now, I'm sitting here, but I potentially can get up and go make myself a cup of tea, right? But with God, there's no such thing as as potentiality and actuality, and he proves that philosophically on page 249. On page 250, right, he continues with the chat with the paragraph that begins on the bottom of 249. Raman presents a whole bunch of arguments demonstrating philosophically through Aristotelian, uh, you know, principles that that how why God cannot be corporeal, why can, God cannot contain a body of any sort. And he describes that. If the second paragraph on page 250, another method, Raman described, he describes more arguments that prove against incorporeality that can prove you know and i'm sorry that prove unity that proves god's unity that it can't be two there has to be just one okay um so he continues with that on page 251 um he continues with more proofs against the corporeality of god and i'm going to jump past that and then the um we're going to go to page 252 and i've just summarized the various things that Ramam proves in chapter one uh the um I'm just going to read the last two sentences. I turn to page 252. So now that now that Ramam has has given us solid proofs, right? Aristot using Aristotelian philosophy of the basic ideas that are fundamental to Ramam's philosophy and understanding of what monotheism is, right? That God is one. That God has no cause. No cause. That God is not potential or actual. He just is. That God doesn't have a body. That you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And 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 he proved these using principles and ideas of Aristotelian physics. After having first set forth these demonstrations, and this is the last two sentences of 252, I shall start to give an epitome of that method which is emphatically ours, as we have promised. 
Now, ours meaning ours as Jews in Torah, okay? So now that I've proven to you scientifically that this is the truth, just think about this because this is classic Maimonides. This is very, very different than somebody who were to come to you and say, you should believe in God because, because, because you should, right? For Amuna Pshuta, which many, many Jewish philosophers do uh, uh, push such, such an idea. And I, I'm not here to pick and choose between them, but I'm here to just demonstrate what Rambam says and teaches. Rambam teaches, right, that we need to demonstrate, and, and Rambam, along with many other of the uh, uh, known as the rationalists, we've shown him, such as the Chov Salavavos or Ben Bachi Ibn Pakuda, and, and many others felt that to demonstrate the truth of God, we should demonstrate it scientifically. We should demonstrate it logically, philosophically. And that's why we should believe, because we prove that it's true. Now, um, but now I'm going to tell you, now that I told you these Aristotelian things, I'm going to do what I promised at the beginning of this book, which is to show you, well, what about those places where it doesn't seem to work with the Torah, right? Now I'm going to show you how this all works according to the Torah, those of us that believe in the Torah, those of us that read the Torah, those of us that ascribe to this religion. So here goes, um, chapter two. In the beginning, he mentions the fifth body, right? Now, the fifth body refers to uh, also what Aristotle ca calls like the, the fifth, um, the, there's four elements, right? The elements of, uh, you know, earth, air, water, fire, right? The four main elements. But there's a fifth element that exists that the spheres are made of, and Aristotle called that the ether, right? That fifth um, body, which the sphere, that outer sphere is made out of, right, is, is a different substance, okay? So uh, according to Aristotelian physics, the name ether lasted in, uh, in science until the turn of the 20th century, uh, before we understood that space was filled with nothingness, right? Before the even concept of nothing existed. But, um, but the... The fifth body uh, is, is what he discussed in chapter five. And I'm going to, um, uh, once, once we established, right, that, um, and here I'm going to start, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip the first paragraph, right? Uh, well, actually, let me read through the first paragraph. Okay, the fifth body, namely the sphere, cannot but be either subject to generation and corruption, in which case movement would likewise be subject to generation and corruption. Um, if this, uh, wait, let me skip a little bit because uh, there's one place where I want to get to in this paragraph. Give me a second. Thus, I want to start from the word thus, which is the first word on the line somewhere in the middle of the first paragraph in chapter two. Thus, it has become clear to you that the existence of the deity may be exalted, who is the necessary of existence, right? In other words, he has to exist because I just demonstrated that has no cause, right? Nothing made him exist. And in his existence, in respect to his essence, there is no possibility, right? In other words, it's an absolute necessity. Is proved by cogent and certain demonstrations. In other words, now that I proved it scientifically, by and you can't you can't knock me down, regardless of whether the world has come into being in time after having been non-existent. And I haven't yet dealt with the essential difference between me and Aristotle. The the line that draws what difference, what different. Where's the difference lie between me as a Jew who reads the Torah and Aristotle who came up with the same conclusions? That difference lies primarily in was there a creator, right? Right? Was there a moment of creation or was this always how it's been and will this always be the way it will be? So, so Ramam is necessarily telling us that in this first chapter, I didn't talk about, I didn't prove to you that there has to be a creator, right? I just proved to you Right. In other words, that, that it has, the world had to have been created in time. So regardless of whether or not you're going to agree with Aristotle, right, whether it has not come into beginning time after having been non-existent, or if you agree with me that there is has been a creation of, of ex nihilo, yesh me'ayin, right? Similarly, demonstrations prove that he is one and not a body, as we have set forth before. For the demonstration that he is one and not a body is valid, regardless of whether the world has come into being in time after having been non-existent or not, as we have made clear, right? And when refuting the belief in his corporeality and so on. Now I think it fit, and I'm starting the, the bottom par paragraph on, pa on page 252, that I should complete the exposition of the opinions of the philosophers, that I should explain their proofs concerning the existence of separate intellects. Now, this is crucial. 
So pay attention to this because this is going to help us understand so much about how the Rambam looks at, at the world. And that is, is that Aristotle understood that these spheres that are moving around, they contain within them what Aristotle called a separate intellect. Okay. And, I, and that I should explain the concordance of this opinion with the foundations of our law, with the foundations of the Torah. I refer to what the law teaches concerning the existence of angels, okay? Now, Ramam is trying to say over here something that's really, really, really important. Ramam understands that angels are a scientific phenomena. They're not a supernatural being, but they're built into the laws of the physics of the, of the world that we live in. And what angels are, are, and, and I accordingly shall complete this purpose. After that, I shall go back, and I promise I'm going to get into that a little deeper in a second. As I have promised, to arguing with a view to proving that the world has come into existence in time. And then I'm going to demonstrate that why I believe that I'm right and Aristotle is wrong, that the world came into existence at a particular time. <laughs> for our strongest proofs for this <clears throat> are valid and can be made clear only after one knows that separate intellects exist and after one knows how proofs for their existence may be adduced. So the Ramam says there's another Aristotelian idea that's important. Now, nowadays, you and I discuss motion and movement of objects in terms of forces, right? Where we talk about the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force. We talk about forces. We talk about, right, uh, forces within nature. Aristotle understood that when things move, there must be something moving them. And just like when a human being decides, I'm going to walk from here to there, there's a soul within that human being that decides, I'm going to walk from here to there, right? So too, there's intellects. And, and Ramam is going to say, I don't know exactly what he means. We're going to get into it a little bit more. There's intellects, there's beings that are deciding, right, within those spheres that are making those motions in space, right? And then the sphere below it that gets moved, there's intellects that do those things. And those intellects last all the way down to what we see in front of us. So that when we see things moving or doing stuff, right, those are what Aristotle would call intellects, right? There's intellects, there's things in there deciding these things. I emphasize strongly that this was the scientific idea of the time. This is what they understood because they didn't have the concept of forces like we have today. And Rambam therefore says, this is what the Torah means when the Torah talks about angels. The Torah is talking about those, those intellects that exist within those spheres of nature, right, that make decisions to move around, right? And the decisions are made. The decision that a malach, that an angel makes, is based on the laws of nature that God put into that thing, right? So, um, and that's why we'll see as we go through, Ramam understands that a malach, an angel, can't do something that he wasn't, so to speak, commanded by God. But the way the Ramam sees that is that he was commanded by God because that's how God set the laws of nature in place. Now, I want you, and I'm, I know I'm going to take a big jump now, but I'm going to say this anyway because I really want you to understand what I mean. Why, like, when we think what, it's intellects, like, what's he talking about? Like, there's no intellects in space. Like, like what does he mean? Well, this is, this. Uh, so how does that relevant to me? Well, the way it's relevant to me is that it's, it's I'm, I'm virtually certain, and if you disagree with me, you can say so, that had the Rambam been alive today, and there's so many people that say, what if Rambam was alive today, what would he think? Well, I obviously no one knows. That's one of those big what if questions. But I'm going to say right now something that I probably have no right to say, but I'll say it anyway, that if the Rambam was alive today and he knew about forces, he would call those angels, right? Because that's the scientific force that go, because that that is what, so in other words, and as we'll see as we go through Rambam, when Rambam talks about what demons are and what angels are, these are not supernatural forces. These are the scientific forces by which the world goes around. That's why Rambam defines a demon as an illness, right? It's simply an angel. It's a force of nature that's having something that we perceive as a negative effect on us. So we call that a demon as opposed to an angel, right? So there's no supernatural you know, uh, beings with wings flying around that are white and beautiful and those are angels and ugly black ones with horns on their head that are that are demons, right? But but the gen the forces of nature that we see around us are what angels and demons are. So Ramam is understanding, he's he's using Aristotelian language because that is what he knew and that's how he understood the world. But that's this is what I mean by an example of how this is so relevant to us today. And think about for a moment, try to absorb the impact of what that means to how you look at the world around us and how it works, okay? And then Ramam says something else in the, in the next thing of this preface. 
And here's going to explain something really, really important. Um, and I'm going to read his words. Okay, know that my purpose in this treatise of mine was not to compose something on natural science. I'm not giving you a science book, right? Even though to you and I, for those of us that are unschooled in Aristotelian science, this was a pretty good introduction. And he's kind of humble because he did in those 26 principles, he did something that even the, the Aristotelian scholars say no one else did, you know, melt it down into such finite and easy to understand terms. But, but nonetheless, I'm not writing a science book or to make an epitome of notions pertaining to the divine science, according to some doctrines. I'm also not telling you all about the, the science of God or to demonstrate what has been demonstrated in them. Nor was my purpose in this treatise to give a summary and description of the disposition of the spheres or to make known their number, how many spheres there are and what each one does and so on. For the books composed concerning these things matters, these matters are adequate. You, there's plenty of books in the library. If you wanna read about physics, go to the library and you're welcome to read them. And nowadays you can go online and you can read all, all you want to about Aristotle if you want. If, however, they should turn out to, not to be adequate with regard to some subject, right? That which I shall say concerning that subject will not be superior. In other words, and Rambam in his humility says, and if I do try to explain something that, you, that, that might be difficult to understand, I'm not necessarily a better scientist than the other Aristotelians you can read, right? I might not be, you know, don't think that I'm an authority on this Aristotle so that if I say something different than someone else that I'm somehow better than they are, right? However, my purpose in this treatise, and this is crucial to understanding why we've been sitting this last year and a half studying this book together and why Rambam wrote this book. My purpose, as I have informed you in its introduction, is only to elucidate the difficult points of the law, meaning of the Torah, right? And to make manifest the true realities of its hidden meaning. The purpose, what I'm going to do, which the multitude cannot be made to understand because of these matters being too high for it. People often look at the Torah and don't understand them, right? So in other words, the reason why I'm trying to do is when we see something in the Torah that seems to be difficult to understand because it, it seems to contradict the scientific principles that I have laid out, I'm here to tell you how that works, how you're supposed to learn the Torah and what it really means, right? He just, he just hinted, right, with the angel business, right? When the Torah talks about angels, how does that fit into my scientific knowledge of the world? This is a question that a person could ask you at the Shabbos table this weekend. Someone's gonna, a skeptic will come to your Shabbos table and say, like, what's this baloney about angels and eh, demons and what is all this stuff? I don't see, there's no angels. They've done scientific experiments. Nobody can prove their existence. Well, I'm not telling you how to answer it because you can choose which brand of Judaism you like. But if you're a rationalist, my Manadian, or if at least you want to tell the person, well, hey, you can be a my Manadian and say, that yes, there is no angels and demons. Those forces of science that you're measuring in the lab are angels. Again, sink, let that sink in. Those, those things you're studying when you're studying, do a scientific experiment and you determine why this proton does this and electron does that, that's angels. That's what the Rambam just said. And let that sink in, right? Just I, I, I don't know how possibly I can tell you how important this idea is. But at least that's what Maimonidean Judaism is. So keep that in mind, because that's what we're learning now. Hence, if you perceive that I speak about the establishment of the existence of the separate intellects and about their number, or about the number of the spheres and the causes of their motion, or investigating the true reality of matter and form, or the notion of divine overflow and about other such notions, you ought not to think, and it ought not occur to you that I intended only to investigate the true reality of that particular philosophic notion. I'm not here to teach you the philosophy, for these notions have been expounded in many books. Again, you, and the correctness, the idea is to prove Aristotle's ideas right. You go read other books. Don't read my book for that, right? I have something special to offer the world because I'm trying to show you how it works with the Torah, right? For these notions, right, I only intend to mention matters, the understanding of which may elucidate some difficulty in the Torah. In fact, many knots will be unraveled through the knowledge of a notion of which I give an epitome. Once I give an explanation, so many things in the Torah, I'm going to give an explanation. It's going to untie so many knots that you've been bouncing around your head. I don't understand this Kamara. I don't understand what this Chazal said. I don't understand what this rabbi said. I'm going to give you a notion. I'm going to give you a place here. But as you, if you let it sink in, you'll untie so many knots is how the Ramam says. And it's really true because when you take this, Ramam obviously is not going to go through every single Chazal. I mean, we've been learning Daf Yomi for years and years and years. There's so much there and so many questions. You couldn't possibly mention every single one. 
but he's going to mention a principle. And if you take it to mind, you'll see it all untie this knot and this knot and this knot. And all of a sudden, you'll be able to understand how a Maimonidean will understand all of those chazals. Already from the introduction of this, my treatise, that it hinges on the explanation of what can be understood in the account of the beginning and the account of the chariot, right? So that's Masa Bereshis and Masa Merkava, which is Rambam's Hebrew terminology, which refers to the Aristotelian physics and metaphysics. And the clearing up of the difficulties attaching to prophecy, right? And when, when I explain to you how prophecy works, you'll only understand it based on this explanation that I'm giving you and to the knowledge of the deity accordingly. In whatever chapter you find me discoursing with the view to explaining a matter already demonstrated in natural science or a matter demonstrated in divine science or an opinion which has been shown or a matter attaching to that which has been explained in mathematics. No, that I'm, I'm, not, I'm only going through that not because I want to be writing a science book. I'm doing that to know that that particular matter must be a key to the understanding of something to be found in the books of prophecy. I'm saying it because I'm going to use that idea so you can understand something that a Navi says in, the, in, in Tanakh and then it'll make sense to you. The reason why I mentioned, explained, and elucidated that matter would be found in the knowledge it procures us of the account. Because of this Aristotelian principle that I might mention, I'm mentioning it only because now when you study Masa Beratius, and when you study Masa Merkava, right? When you study the Torah, in other words, right? You'll be able to use that principle to understand what the Navi Ishayahu or Zachariah or Daniel or whoever it happened to be was trying to really say, at least according to me, Ramba, right? Or it would be found in an explanation that it furnishes some root regarding the notion of prophecy or some explanation of the belief of some other opinion that the Torah is, is trying, to, some, one of the emunos, one of the beliefs that the Torah is teaching us. After having set forth this preface, now that I understand, now you understand what I'm trying to do, right? Right? So now I'm going to go back to doing it. I shall go back to completing the exposition upon which we had started. Now let's go do it. All right? I'm going to read chapter three. And then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop for questions for today because we're as you can feel we're about to get into the juice into the meat of this uh, of of the Rambam of uh, of his genius of how he you know instead of taking science and having it um, conflict or having so the Rambam established what in his mind was absolute truth and he's looking at the Torah which in his mind is absolute truth and how how do they work together and he's gonna show us how a, a rationalist like Rambam makes it all work, okay? And we're going to go through that process with him as we go through the next few chapters. But the next one is a little bit, of, is a little bit more of the introduction, so I'm going to read it. No, this is chapter three. I'm on page 254 in the pine. Know that though the opinions held by Aristotle regarding the causes of the motion of the spheres are simple assertions which no demonstration has been made. In other words, I told you that Aristotle believes there are intellects moving those things, and the Rambam is hinting now that he understands, and I'll make this clear because a lot of people don't get this. Rambam is saying, and I understand that Aristotle never really proved that idea. So I realized in the back of my mind, Rambam is telling us that someday somebody might have another explanation as to what makes those things move. He didn't have, he, he, Newton didn't exist yet. Einstein didn't exist yet. The ideas about forces of nature didn't, well, in, in a modern sense, didn't exist yet, right? However, um, the, yet they are, of all the opinions put forward on this subject, of all the ideas that people have proposed until this point, those that are exposed to the smallest number of doubts, right? In other words, they raise some questions that aren't answered, which of course spurred hundreds and hundreds of years of scientific endeavor until we got to where we are today. And today there's still questions which are spurring more and more scientific endeavors and who knows what we'll discover in the next hundred years, right? But um, but they're still the ones that, at least as of this time, are exposed to the smallest number of doubts and those that are the most suitable for being put into coherent order. Just as Alexander, and he's referring to a philosopher, says in the Principles of the All, which is a ma major book of Aristotelian philosophy, these sayings are also in... Now listen to this one. These sayings, in other words, assuming that these um, spheres have intellects, right, that guide them and that make decisions about movement, right, are in harmony with many sayings in the Torah. I'm translating the word to the law because in the Hebrew, the term used actually is the Torah, right? And more particularly with what is explained in the generally known Midrashim, right? In the, about whose have been composed by the sages, there is no doubt. Ramam is understanding that some of the Midrashim might not be authentic, but in terms of the authentic, well-known ones, Aristotle's 
sayings are what Ramam exactly is referring to as the non-authentic ones, that's up for grabs. Uh, you can try to imagine what he might mean, but he doesn't say. It. But um, but the authentic midrashim, the sayings of the sages over the years, the Aristotelian ideas of there being intellects moving these things make sense and it fits with the Torah. It works, right? Um, I therefore shall set forth his opinions and his proofs. That's why I'm using Aristotle because it, right now is the best science I have, right? So that I may call from them what agrees with the law and with, in other words, with the Torah and corresponds to the sayings of the sages of Chazal, may their memory be blessed. All right, so, so we have now an introduction and, and in the next, in the upcoming things we're gonna see, Ramam is gonna take these Aristotelian ideas and show us how they work with the Torah um, and um, and so in, in starting in, in chapter four, we have a little bit more Aristotelian stuff, but starting in chapter five, he's going to, we're going to have practical verses. We're going to have psukim, right? We're going to have chaz, uh, statements of Chazal. We're going to, and drama is going to show us how it works, how he can show you from the Torah, from Chazal, that his approach is, is right. So, and that's where, that's where we stop, we stop with the, the philosophy and we start learning Torah again. The last two, this week and last week, we were kind of not really learning Torah, but it's all, it's all good. It's all important. Anyway, I, I think this is a good place to stop. And if anyone uh, wants to speak, ask questions, make comments, argue with me, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Very much appreciated. Yeah, today, today uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're in for a, a real treat as we go through the rest of this. Uh, go ahead, Leslie. You wanted to say something? I just had a question because I I I love the idea about the angels and mm -hmm. being the forces of nature. But so, would he interpret that the the angels who visit Abraham, you know, the guests, um, that they're really just they weren't angels as as most people talk about angels. So, well, well, first of all, Ramam specifically deals with that particular episode in a famous debate with the other commentaries. The Ramam feel, holds that that entire thing was a dream. Ah, uh, okay. The entire episode was a, was, was a vision. And the okay. same with Jacob wrestling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't remember if he says that specifically there, but, pro but if it he doesn't- It would make sense. Yeah, but in, in many of those episodes, Ramam explains but that one specifically, and Ramban famously, you know, doesn't attacks him, and others attack him on that. But 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 that's but Ramam felt that that in a whole episode was just a dream, and uh, now that's all you need to know. Everything else makes sense once it's a dream. <laughs> makes right? sense to me. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, I, I'm I like I keep saying, you know, it is important from other perspectives to realize that there's Ramam is clearly is not the only authentic approach within the range of, of Judaism. There's a lot of approaches and many disagree with him, but this class is about Ramam. So I want to teach you Ramam's approach and that's what we're doing, okay? Any, um, any other comments or questions? Well, if there aren't, then I'm gonna close up shop for this week and uh, Mirch Hashem, next week we'll uh, we'll be see it. We'll be here again. And we'll keep on rolling. It's gonna Thank get more you. and more and more fun. I promise. This is gonna get better and better. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. All right. Feel better. Thanks. <laughs>